Call this meeting to order. Roll call, please. Mayor Weiss. Here. Deputy Mayor Lowry. Here. Councilmember Feller. Here. Councilmember Kern. Here. Councilmember Sanchez. Here. Yeah, please rise for the invocation. If you'd all please join me in bowing our heads. Ah, Father, we come before you to say thank you. Thank you for the privilege, the blessing, the honor it is to reside here in the city of Oceanside. We come together tonight as a diverse community, a community of different backgrounds, different beliefs, different presence, and different futures, yet one common goal, and that is the betterment of this city. We come together tonight to seek your guidance, wisdom, and discernment during the deliberations that transpire this evening. And in doing so, we lift up Councilmember Feller, Councilmember Kern, Councilmember Sanchez, Deputy Mayor Lowry, and Mayor Weiss. May you grant them wisdom and guidance as they lead our city into a bright and prosperous future. We say all these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Right hand over your heart, flag over here. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. So our first presentation is our Employee Service Award. So if we could have everyone, including department directors, come down to uh, congratulate our employees. Good evening, Mayor Weiss, council members, department directors, and audience. It's with great pleasure that we present to you tonight two employees who have reached the praiseworthy accomplishment of 20 years of service with the city of Oceanside. When your name is called, please come forward. Brent Keys. Brent initiated his career with the City of Oceanside on March 22nd, 1998 as a police officer. However, Brent was initially hired August 1997 as an extra help part-time employee in the police department. Brent currently works in the Crimes of Violence Investigations Division. Some of his past assignments have been Neighborhood en enhance Enhancement Team, SWAT Team, and Special Enforcement Section in Vice and Narcotics. Brent continues to be a team player and a valuable member to the Oceanside Police Department. Let's congratulate Brent for 20 years of service to our community. Thank you, Brent. Next and last, we have Alfred Ramirez. <laughs> Al launched his career with the city of Oceanside on April 20th, 1998, as an electrician in the water utilities department. Alfred continues to work in water utilities, currently serving as an instrumentation supervisor. Let's congratulate Alfred for 20 years of service with a round of applause.
Thank you, Al. That concludes our service awards for tonight. Congratulations once again. At this time, I'd like to invite the Poppy people to come on forward. So we have a proclamation for you for Poppy Month. And with that, I'd like to have you say a few words about what it all means. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Barbara, good evening. Here. I'm Dan. I've got to put a five on. I am on. the member of the American Moss Gallery Unit, 140 yeah. on Ocean Side. And every year we come in, and you folks are gracious enough to give us the uh, Poppy, Poppy Proclamation. And we really do appreciate it. This is a very big fundraiser for us that we help the veterans. And some of the things that we do with the money that we raise while we're handing out copies, we work with the honor flight. And I'm sure you've all heard of it. This oh, yeah. is where veterans get to go back to the World War II memorial right now. And also, they're starting to work with the Korean War veterans to go to that. North County Stand Down, Fisher House at Camp Pendleton. If you don't know what that is, it's very similar to what a Ronald McDonald House is. We support them because they support our veterans and give their families and the veterans a place to stay when someone is having surgery or long-term medical care at the Camp Pendleton Hospital. Children and Youth Services at Camp Pendleton, backpacks, school supplies, and even ice cream parties for the kids out there and helping them when the kid, their parents are deployed. Wounded Warriors Dinners, which has come to an end because it just does, the scheduling just doesn't work, but that was a monthly project for us. VA Hospital and the Oceanside VA Clinic. We work, we have many of our members that volunteer there. We also do a lot of donations there. And there's many more things we do. I couldn't bring them all down. Again, thank you very much. And thank you for all you do. So you're going to. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I have. Um, Dave, I can't even think. Dave Klein, who is the who is the uh, Suns post commander. He's the commander of the Suns, which are gentlemen that that were not in the Vietnam War or one of our wars because of their age, but their dads were. That correct? Okay. Antonio Zurs, who is our post commander for the American Legion, and I have Elaine Pilzer, who is actually the Poppy chairman, but she wasn't going to talk. So I got you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Everybody in the audience needs to get some poppy. I got five bucks here. Thank you. Thanks. You're not giving him a credit card, I can tell you that. You know, we don't sell anything. I know that. that other <laughs> Thank you so much. It's very Thank sweet. You. Thank you. Do you have thin mints? <laughs> Take this, would you, please? Gosh. Yeah, don't forget that. All right. And finally, I'd like to have Emerald come forward from the chamber for our business spotlight with your member. Hello, everyone. My name is Emerald Lowe, and I'm with the Oceanside Chamber of Commerce. Today, I'm here to honor Rachel Walker of Spirit of Sharing. Rachel has um, been the administrator of Spirit for Sharing for over 11 years. Before that, though, she was a Marine veteran and a military spouse and can truly attest to the struggles that military families face. So this month, for the member of the month, we are honoring Spirit of Sharing. Um, and we have Chastity, their lead volunteer, who can tell you a little bit more about what they do there. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chastity Ross. I've been the lead volunteer since 2012. I'm actually a military spouse myself. My husband's been in the Marine Corps um, for 16 years. Um, I came across Spirit of Sharing from needing assistance back in 2012, so I can see um, both ends of their scope of how they provide assistance. 
Um, Spirit of Sharing is a 501c3 charity that gives or provides immediate uh, emergency assistance, depending on what the family's needs are, um, to active duty military and recently separated veterans. Um, the scope of assistance can range from A to Z, depending on what the family's uh, need is at the time. There is an on-site uh, food and diaper bank, as well as furniture, household. Um, then Spirit of Sharing is ran solely on donations. The things in the warehouse can really uh, depend on what the donations are at that time. Um, if anyone needs to reach out, they can, um, I have flyers here, or you can reach us um, on the website. Well, thank you very much for all you do, and um, you have a certificate from us and an appreciation from all of us for, like I said, everything you do. session report. Thank you. The City Council met in closed session to discuss item one on the agenda conference with labor negotiator involving the status of negotiations with the Oceanside Firefighters Association. The council also met on item two on the closed session agenda conference with real property negotiator involving a portion of the El Corazon property negotiating party City of Oceanside and Sterling development under negotiations with the price and terms for the sale of the real property. Finally, the council met on the agenda addendum item 2B, conference with real estate negotiator involving the property located at 2008 North Harbor Drive. Ne negotiating parties were the Oceanside Small Craft Harbor District and Pacific Suites Incorporated. Under negotiations are price and terms for the lease of the real property. Um, as I indicated before, the council met on all three of those items. There's no reportable action under the Brown Act on any of those items. Consent, Keller? Yes, consent calendar, item number six and item number nine have been pulled from the consent calendar. Item number six by the public, item number nine by Deputy Mayor Lowry. Eight, eight, eight. Oh. Eight. Yes. You want, and item number eight. I'm eight, not nine. It's eight, eight not nine. Okay, item number eight instead of item number nine. Thank you. We have a motion on the balance? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, I'd like to um, have the record reflect my no votes on items nine and 10 and uh, my conflict on item number eight and move approval for balance. Second. We have a motion and a second, please vote. Motion approved, five zero. I will start with item number six. Item number six is approval of amendment one to the property use agreement with North County Lifeline, a California nonprofit organization for the premises located at 402 Brook Street, extending the term of the agreement for a period of five years from May 1st, 2018 through April 30th, 2023, with compensation to the city in the form of maintenance of the premises and payment of utilities and security services and authorization for the city manager to execute the amendment. Uh, Joan Brown can speak at this time. My name is Joan Brown, and I live on Rockledge Street. And uh, good evening, Council. Um, I wanted to talk about um, 402 Brooks, because better known as the Campfire Girl Building, because I believe I've been here before in in regards to the sidewalks there, and that it's not um, ADA compliant the curb there because it's uh, you cannot get back up to the corner where the building is unless you go through um, a driveway. And lately, um, cars are parking on the sidewalk. And I realize there is no place to park on Brooks. So my idea on this would be because when those uh, cars park next to the building on the sidewalk, it's like the broken window syndrome. People see you do it, they're going to do it. So now the cars are parking. When I came there tonight, there was a car parked there on the, right in the middle of the sidewalk, plus the two cars that always park there. And they must be workers or volunteers. 
And that's a very good thing that the city is doing f for the nonprofit. It's a very good nonprofit. But my suggestion would be to designate the parking spaces in front of that building for the workers who work there or the volunteers who volunteer there. And I believe you, the city can do that because the city, the car oil from the car is parking there. And sometimes on a Friday night, they'll be parking there all night right in the middle of the sidewalk. So maybe if you designate and put signs up, no parking on the sidewalks, and then it's only good for those people who pick up children there uh, or work there. It would be a very good thing. Thank you. No further public on this item. Councilmember Feller. Thank you. This is an opportunity to uh, ask our, our public works or code enforcement to look at the corner directly across the street from 402 Brooks. Um, it's, I think it's turning into a very dangerous situation. Uh, it's a, there's a little bench sitting back against the freeway wall and just directly over the wall on the freeway property there's uh, something going on there that's it, it's it's deteriorating rapidly rapidly with trash and and all kinds of things that um, that uh, the um, I know I've called it in about 10 or 12 times so um, and we we just can't seem to get it cleaned up and I think they need it I think they need uh, to look at that as a matter of safety just for those kids there thank you councilmember Sanchez thank you um, thank you Joan for your comments um, we'll ask the city manager to go ahead and address that um, address that issue figure out what what uh, staff would recommend to to fix that so I'm going to go ahead and move approval I'll second. we have a motion and a second please vote Councilmember Sanchez, oh, thank you. Motion approved, 5-0. Next we have item number eight. Item number eight is approval of professional service agreement with RJM Design Group of San Juan Capistrano in an amount not to exceed $181,352 for a project study report and development of construction documents including plans, specifications, and estimates for bidding the Balderrama Park Improvement Project and authorization for the city manager to execute the agreement. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lowry. Thank you. Uh, this is for a plan for a much ignored, very needing, uh, very much needing improvement park in, right up here on, in the east side neighborhood, uh, Balderrama Park. The city spends a lot of money there dealing with crime and making it safe for people, but now we're going to finally remodel the park and put in much needed infrastructure. So it's been needed for so long. I spoke with our Director of Neighborhood Services, Marjorie Pierce, about the specific changes. And I know this will be a great improvement for that entire neighborhood. This is their park. So I'm happy to be here and able to move this forward. It has been years since anything has been done there to pay attention to the needs of that community. So I will hope to join everyone else in voting yes on this item. You have to make the motion to approve. I want to make a motion to approve item number eight. Do we have a seconds. motion and a second? Please vote. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I, I hit the wrong button. My apologies. Thank you. Pass one zero. Yeah. <laughs> that was my, my apologies. Please vote. Do I have to do it again? Yes. Yeah, sorry, oh, Council Member Curry. down there. Oh, there. You All can right. just one more time. So sorry. There we go. Oh, All right. Go. Great. Motion approved for zero. Sanchez recused. Item 12. Item number 12 is adoption of a resolution appropriating $3.13 million in road maintenance and rehabilitation account funds provided by Senate Bill 1 to be held in the city gas tax fund 213 and approving the city's project list of street slurry seal and asphalt overlay program for fiscal year 2018-2019. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members. I'm Gary Kellison with the Development Services Department.
Excuse me, let me bring up the correct uh, PowerPoint. Can you, uh, I can't read the uh, laptop. Apologize for the delay. Uh, Gary Kellison with the public, uh, excuse me, the Development Service Department. The item before you is approval of uh, a <clears throat> request to appropriate $3.1 million in road maintenance and uh, rehabilitation account funds per Senate Bill SB1. And the secondly, to approve the city's SB1 project list for FY. 2018-19, consisting of two projects. SB1 is a very new uh, project, a new, uh, excuse me, a new state program. The history was approved exactly one year ago by the state legislature as a supplement to the city's longstanding gas tax program. The uh, city's first SB1 project was approved by the City Council October, and that's utilizing partial funds for, for this year as the uh, law came to effect, and the city then began to draw its revenues starting in February of this year. The um, full programming of SB1 funds for the upcoming fiscal year um, is what City Council is looking at tonight. And the uh, CTC requests that cities program uh, the funds in advance by May 1st of each year. So this is the first full year phase into the program, and our programs are due to the CTC in Sacramento on May 1st. <clears throat> SBC was intend SB1 uh, was intended to address some. Uh, uh, long-standing deficiencies in the way the state-funded uh, road maintenance work. Um, it establishes a brand new road maintenance and rehabilitation account. Half of it is used to address state needs through Cal, uh, Caltrans. The other half is distributed proportionately to cities and counties to take care of their local street repair and maintenance needs. There's a cost of living increase built in to SB1 account as well as the existing uh, highway user tax account. Previously, this has been a problem because gas taxes were, fa were priced as a fixed number of pennies per gallon. As the cost of gasoline goes up, it does nothing to help the state's uh, uh, maintenance accounts for road repairs. It has a number of accountability provisions. State, as the city's approved project lists, we identify the benefits of the individual projects and we provide the state audited reports. This uh, chart is the distribution of the city's, uh, or the source of the uh, city's uh, uh, road maintenance uh, and uh, new road construction account uh, funds for the upcoming fiscal year. The dark blue represents SB1 funds which will be phased in fully next year. Uh, roughly a quarter of our ongoing revenue and actually increasing with inflation in future years. The uh, lighter blue is our existing gas tax which is largely used to fund the street maintenance work of the public works department. Uh, the teal color is uh, uh, Transnet, and the uh, green uh, various federal highway related grants. The two projects that uh, staff recommends to fund with SB1 funds next year are um, Street Slurry Seal Program and the um, overlay program, particularly supplementing the needs on the overlay program for El Camino Real. 
So, in conclusion, staff recommends that the City Council appropriate $3.13 million in RMRA funds and approve the project list of slurry seal and the asphalt overlay streets for FY 2018-19. No public on the side. Deputy Mayor Lowry. Thank you. I don't have any real questions. I have a statement to make. This money that we're talking about is from, as you've been saying, from SB1, that is the uh, gas tax. And we are already receiving funding for that. We're spending it just as fast as we can before someone in Sacramento changes their minds and wants to take the money back. So I've already been told that North County Transit District is receiving money, Sandag is receiving money, so if we want our streets to be improved, we're using this money as fast as we can. There's a, a um, petition being passed around to eliminate this income, and I want to point out that if we don't get this cash into our system, like we're doing tonight at the council meeting, we will not have the money that we need to repair the streets, and there's nowhere else to pick it up. So I really think this is an excellent program and we're using the money as fast as the people can get it on the job, so thank you. Is that a motion? Uh, and I want to make a motion to approve. Second. Councilmember Sanchez? I was going to make the motion. Thank you. A uh, motion and a second. Please vote. Motion approved, 5-0. Item number 13 is approval of professional services agreement with Tetra Tech of Irvine in the amount of $1,844,000 for the Pure Water Oceanside Project and authorization for the city manager to execute the agreement. Good evening, Honorable, Honorable Mayor and Council Members, Carrie Dale, Water Utilities Director. With me this evening, to my left is Steve Tedesco from Tetra Tech. He's the project manager on this proposed project, as well as Adam Hoke with Hoke Engineering, and he is the project manager as the city's representative. I'm very excited to be here this evening to present on item number 13, which is approval of a professional services agreement with Tetra Tech for design of Pier Water Oceanside. Before I talk about Council's action, I'm going to provide a high-level overview of what the project consists of. Pure Water Oceanside will be Oceanside's new source of water and will be generated by purifying recycled water to produce a drought-proof and environmental sound local water supply. Develop development of this local program is driven by many factors, which include the majority of water coming into the city from faraway places, such as Northern California and the Colorado River. This is a, a very expensive source of supply, and as we've seen in the last few years when we had drought conditions, it was subject to cutbacks and was at risk. We've also experienced quality and quantity problems with the city's aquifer, so the levels of the water in the ground have been declining. In addition, Council has established a goal of 50% local water supply development by 2030. After water goes through the treatment systems at the San Luis Rey Water Reclamation Facility, the program will use advanced state-of-the-art treatment steps that replicate and accelerate nature's recycling process creating high quality water that is exceptionally clean and safe. As an example, the treatment processes shown on the slide here are what would make up the treatment system. If you think of the width of your hair, so something very, very small, think of something 300 times as small as the width of your hair, that type of thing is removed out of that first step there, the microfiltration. Reverse osmosis, which is the same type of treatment that's used at the Mission Basin facility and at the Carlsbad uh, desalination plant removes salts, pharmaceuticals, viruses, as well as microplastics. The final step is disinfection by ultraviolet light as well as advanced oxidation. 
These same proven purification methods are already being used around the world, as well as as close by as Orange County. In fact, Orange County's groundwater replenishment system is the largest advanced water purification facility and meets the needs of 850,000 residents, including the Disneyland Park and Knott's Berry Farm. There's also other examples of these types of programs being completed within the state. Pure Water Monterey is a, a very similar project to what we have here in Oceanside. There are several components that make up the project. The component we're talking about tonight is the Advanced Water Purification Facility, which will be co-located at the San Luis Rey Water Reclamation Facility. Additional components include up to three wells that will inject highly purified water into the aquifer, as well as transmission pipelines, shown in red. The project will meet Council's goal to develop 50% local supplies by 2030. We already have a very um, good local source of water at the Mission Basin, which on average produces 15% of our local water needs. And with implementation of this project, as well as other recycled water projects, we're on our way by 2023 with approximately 45% of our local water supplies developed here in Oceanside. Tonight's action is to recommend approval of a professional services agreement with TetraTech in the amount of $1.8 million for Pier Water Oceanside and authorize the city manager to execute the agreement. The city is well positioned for a project like this one. We've been working on um, studies since 2014, and during that time, Council authorized a contract with RMC to prepare an indirect potable reuse study and pathogen removal study. These efforts are being recognized not only in the region but also nationally. Last year we were recognized by the Water Reliability, Water Reliability Coalition as the Agency of the Year for development of the plans for our recycled water system as well as pure water Oceanside. And in 2016, the White House held a, a summit, and um, myself and another scientist were invited to participate in, in that summit. In 2016, a second contract was let with RMC. This contract included mostly geotechnical in investigations as well as environmental documentation. That work is still underway with environmental finishing up in November of this year. This next phase, or phase two, consists of three separate phases. The phase we're discussing today is design of the treatment facility, water lines, and pump stations at the San Luis Rey Water Reclamation Facility. The two later phases will be coming to you for consideration in August or September of this year. This is a, an aerial of the San Luis Rey Reclamation Facility. The area depicted in left there is at the entrance to the plant and is where the enclosed treatment facility will be located. In January of this year, the department sent out an RFP to 17 consulting firms as well as held a mandatory pre-proposal meeting. 15 of, of those 17 were in, in attendance. We received four proposals and staff has selected and recommended TetraTech. And TetraTech scored the highest of all the proposals based on their relevant experience, including the design of the Carlsbad desalination facility and the 70 million gallon Orange County Water District facility, as well as numerous similar facilities throughout the United States. In addition, the TetraTech proposal included differentiating aspects which include a streamlined design process based on previous design experience, an enclosed environment for the treatment processes, and design of advanced controls which may allow for reduction of certain infrastructure. The 
The estimated fee for design work only is $1.8 million and will be funded from the Pure Water Oceanside project, which has an available balance of $2.6 million. Staff's recommendation is shown here. And I'm available for questions. Thank no you. No public on this item. Councilmember Sanchez. I'm going to move approval. Second. Councilmember Feller. Thank you. Uh, we uh, probably all got the same letter today from Matt uh, about uh, them funding the twin tunnels and the effect on our residents uh, in however many years it takes. Uh, they said something like $4 uh, 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 a, a unit or something like that. I, I don't recall what it was that they're going to increase um, uh, the residents. So, uh, and I believe their guesstimation was around 30 uh, percent uh, more availability or self-reliance uh, with this, um, with these twin tunnels. But how does that affect what uh, we need to expect to get to the 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 percentage that we were hoping to get to by 2030. Honorable Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Feller, the Twin Tunnel Project actually improves the reliability of water supplies coming from Northern California and the Delta. It does not increase any volume of water that would be used here locally, so it does not impact any of the local supply goals that Council has set. Oh, I, I think I was thinking that it was going to get easier for us to get water out of those misers. So, yep. all right, thank you. Deputy Mayor Lowry. Thank you. Can you address these uh, items on that uh, slide that you showed about current water use and what the future means? Currently, we're at about we are at about 15 percent of our own water production right now. On average, yes. Okay, and that's uh, our own supplies that we are getting from the ground here in Oceanside. That is correct. River. And then, after 2023, how does that 15 percent change? We anticipate that both with implementing recycled water local supply projects that. The local supply will increase about 15% for those projects and an equal amount um, for this particular project. So that'll put us at about 45% uh, approximately of our water needs will be from within the city. Approximately, depending on how the aquifer reacts to this yeah. project, yes. And, this, and the, the, when you refer to the aquifer reacting, you are Res referencing that we are going to put water back into the aquifer so that we are able to recharge it with our processed water. And then, then we can use that water again. Yes. Okay. And then what is this in 2030? We will be at how much total? We anticipate 52% if all programs are implemented. That includes both phases of this project Pure Water Oceanside, as well as all phases of the recycled water infrastructure program that we discussed with council about two years ago. So this, when, when I discussed it with you a few days ago, I asked you about microplastics, which are plastic fibers and microscopic plastic particles that are in 90% of the bottled water that we're drinking right now all over the world. And I asked if this system that we're working on today, if we approve this, removes the microplastics and you called the manufacturer of the components and they said it does remove microplastics. I, I did some research um, regarding microplastics and whether they're removed through any of the treatment processes. The RO membranes are um, capable of removing that type of, of thing in the water. Okay, so we're producing a higher, we will be able to produce a higher quality water than what people are buying right now in the stores and those little bottles and the gallon jugs and all that. Said that, that 
the report that was recently issued said that 90 percent of those were contaminated with the microparticles. So we are stepping beyond that as an everyday source of water. I think that's a safe assumption. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Kern. Carrie, uh, we talked about this. Now that the lawsuits are done between uh, Santa County Water Authority and Metropolitan Water District, I think the availability for grant funding for Metropolitan is being returned. Um, they kind of suspended it because of the lawsuits. So how does that affect us as far as going forward, maybe getting grants to maybe accelerate this program or actually expand the program? Um, do you know the timing of that and application processes that may go forward? Honorable Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Kern. Um, yes, I do. It's been very positive since the lawsuit has been settled. We had been previously excluded from local resources funding that Metropolitan provides to agencies that develop projects like this one that produce water locally. They provide financial assistance in the means of a credit on each acre foot of water produced. It's fairly uh, substantial. And we estimate that it's over $50 million that could be rebated back to the city in a 20 year time period. Um, in terms of timing, we're working on an application which we anticipate to have before you in August or September that will be forwarded to the Water Authority who will then forward it to Met. So there is a process before it is approved. I did hear Chair Mir this morning talk about Metropolitan not um, excluding any local resource program applications, so that's very positive. But in addition, we've taken the steps to submit an, a feasibility study as part of the earlier work that we um, underwent with RMC, and that was submitted to the Bureau of Reclamation. That allows us to apply for federal funding up to $20 million. So there are other opportunities for us and we're very active in going after state grants as well. So I think there's lots of opportunity to offset the cost of this supply. Okay, thank you. I have just a couple questions. So the, you're purifying the water. To what standard is it purified before you put it back into the ground? Honorable Mayor and Council Members, that's a trick question. Um, <laughs> it, it is purified um, beyond the tertiary standard, which is what recycled water is purified to. So if you would compare it to um, what is done at the Carlsbad desalination facility, that's a comparable treatment process, but it goes through that process and then it is injected into the ground, which in itself is a treatment uh, technology is extracted and treated again. So it's purified more so than the drinking water that you're receiving out of your faucet. Okay. Best guess, how much is the project going to cost? Our estimate is that is um, upwards of 60 to $70 million total to implement, which seems like a large number. However, when you compare the unit cost of water to other sources, such as the Carlsbad desalination facility or other peer water projects that I had up on the screen, it's very comparable and um, will be slightly more than metropolitan supply, but I think with the offsets that we discussed, it will be very comparable. And we also experienced higher costs with the Mission Basin when that was initially constructed, but now we're reaping those rewards and that's our, our most um, inexpensive source of supply for the city. So long term, how do we pay for $70 million? So long term, there will be debt that needs to be issued and we're gearing up to be ready for that and, and to get a very favorable rate from the rating agencies, which will help with our interest rate. We've modeled how that will look in our financials looking out 10 years, and we believe that rates will be fairly stabilized at about 2% uh, rate increases out that two year, uh, out the 10 year. So 2% per year for the next 10 years? With the exception of this year, there is no rate increase this year, yes. But to build projects like this means we need to recover the money from our ratepayers. 
It does, as well as developers, and they are paying an offset as well. Councilmember Sanchez. Yes, um, we when we expanded the uh, the San Luis Rey treatment plant, we took out a fifty million dollar loan from the state. It was, I believe, a no interest loan, and we're paying something like two million dollars a year. Is that right? Honorable Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Sanchez, that is a state revolving fund loan, and it is um, funded by the sewer fund. It's over $3 million a year. It's a, um, it, it, I don't believe it is 0%. It does have a very low interest rate, but it is not 0%. Okay. Um, it has a shorter payback period than a typical bond would have, and so that's why the amount that we pay annually is quite high. So when is that? That was, was a while ago. I Are believe, we almost done? Yeah, I believe it was 2004, 2005, or six. I, I believe that retires in 20 years, so around the 2024 horizon. So we would be, we will no longer have to pay that, and then we'll be picking up this. So there shouldn't be too much of an increase. Well, and uh, yes, partially. This particular cost would be funded by the water fund because it is a water supply development cost. There are some components involving the uh, water reclamation facility that would be funded through the sewer um, fund. But the, the lion's share of this project is through the water fund and through developer fees. In, but in terms of retiring a debt and then acquiring a new debt, there might be a, some overlap, but very little Right. Um, looking at our debt portfolio, there is some retirement of debt in the timeline that this project would be constructed, so in the next couple of years. Yes. Okay. So in terms of the rate, uh, a rate increase, retiring some debt will soften that blow and hopefully won't be much of a rate increase. It, it is as um, we described with Mayor Weiss. It's a very stable um, outlook, uh, out projected out 10 years. Yeah. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion approved, 5 0. How about 16? Yes, we have items off the agenda. We have four speakers on this item. First two speakers are Arlene Hammerschmidt, followed by Sherry Athen. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Arlene Hammerschmidt, um, Ivy Road in Fire Mountain. Eleven years ago, several members of this council approved a vision plan that is now the expectation of residents within its realm. Notable residents contributed to this vision plan include Jimmy Knott, Joan Bachman, Nadine Scott, and many more. Residents living within the influence of Oceanside Boulevard expect our vision plan to be executed. We are understandably really ticked off when we see that our vision is completely is apparently disregarded by the very council members who approved it. These same council members that approved the Oceanside Boulevard vision plan have voted for projects that do not align with the vision that you approved. It's pretty obvious to those of us who are observing that these decision, decisions are apparently made without a guiding vision in mind. Oceanside Boulevard is a gateway right into our city's heart and El Corazon. This boulevard carries our city name, Oceanside Boulevard. If you want to cruise the boulevard in Oceanside, you could cruise Oceanside Boulevard. That's our name, for heaven's sakes. How many opportunities do you get to make a good first impression? We know we get one. 
Surely, council members, we want our first-time Oceanside visitors heading to El Corazon or to the beach to have a beautiful and positive first impression instead of what exists right now. For all of us, please fully instate our Oceanside Boulevard vision plan. It matters not why it was shelved. We have more, <clears throat> more resources than we did 11 years ago. Apply some CPR to this vision and expectation. Bring it to life. It's a beautiful vision and plan. Council members Kern, Sanchez, and Feller, please follow through on your vote. Somebody take the lead and get this puppy back to life. Thank you. Sherry Athen. Sherry Athen. Hi. I just was wanting to talk about the Oceanside Harbor, the changing of the Blue Book rules, we, uh, the, uh, what we were opposing. And we realized that you're not voting on it, and it won't be voted on until June. But I just wanted still to say how much everybody needs to be spoken to about it and listen to what we have to say, because we've lived there for a lot of years, and just coming in and changing things isn't right, isn't fair. Thank you. Our next two speakers are Gloria Ryan and John Alvarez. I'm Gloria Ryan, 92054, patient advocate for the ad hoc, patient advocate for medicinal cannabis patients. Um, we got pretty, banged pretty hard with the ad hoc. Um, people said that we rushed through things. And Councilman Sanchez, you loved, would have loved to have the opportunity and embrace everyone working together. I just recently emailed uh, councilman, fire chief, as well as city planning, a possible challenge or worksheet. The problem here basically is you guys aren't looking through this through a patient's eyes. You guys have luxury of time. You're taking time away from sick people. Uh, thank you, Chuck, for being the only council member to respond. I truly appreciate it. Um, so all I'm basically up here to ask is, what we're asking, and thank you, Mayor, for meeting with me. What, what, what I'm asking here from a patient standpoint is 24 hours of dedication after hearing all your miseducation, just take the journey, six tasks. 24 hours could save years off of someone's life. We could come up with, you could eliminate a lot of your fears and come up with good solutions, as we did when we all worked hard and did our due diligence. Hearing comments like, well, we're leaving up to the city uh, chief of police. I don't live in a militant city. I live in a city that is, is ignoring our vote, not only ignoring the patient here, and I really don't, uh, um, I'm just not feeling it, <laughs> okay? So please, I pretty much have laid it out, have a little action plan there, even if one does it. Esther, you said you wanted to be a part of it. The ad hoc, this is some of the work that we did. Take the time, it's all laid out. Everyone knows that you may be calling them, okay? Then the other thing is, is I don't know if you guys realize, but we just celebrated in the cannabis industry a big holiday, 420. Notice that the city didn't fall down. Notice that children didn't get hurt. And participating at Canna Village, we're worried about all these signs and logos. I have a bag full of logos. This is one of them, okay? You look at that bag, you don't think big pot leaf. Those days are over. Professional businesses are moving in. This is what we've been begging you guys to do your due diligence and eliminate these fears and create a safe access program for sick people. The only problem at Earth Day and in Cannabis Village was Christians protesting against gays, 
lesbians, and the potheads. The only violence that occurred was when an old man said, God is love, go away. The protester pushed him down. Thank goodness the nuns from the LBGD, LBGT, I'm sorry, I'm nervous, saved him. They came and picked him up in the San Diego police, didn't omit the guy that pushed a 70-year-old man down. Please, okay? please wrap up Thank your you. comments. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Alvarez. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Councilman. Uh, my name is John Alvarez. Uh, I've been residing uh, in the Oceanside Harbor on F Dock for uh, about 18 years <clears throat> uh, aboard the uh, 29 foot vessel called the uh, Jody uh, K that we launched back in 2000. So I've been living aboard about 18 years. And I'm here uh, a little bit concerned about this the harbor. Uh, general information handbook and my number one concern is uh, the first page that you have and that is the minimum length of a vessel shall be uh, 32 feet a uh, hull length and current live aboard permits with vessels that are 32 feet like myself uh, will be grandfathered in. <clears throat> uh, the other thing is um, houseboats uh, are prohibited from occupying the harbor and uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a watertight structure with or without means. Uh, any houseboat currently grandfathered and birth with a valid permit cannot be transferred to another permit. And the reason I'm, I'm talking about this is they have told me that I have a liveaboard. board. If you look at the second page, that's the state regulations by the Department of Motor Vehicles defining what a houseboat is and what a liveaboard board uh, and what a vessel is. And the term vessel applies to every description of watercraft used or capable of being used as a means of transportation on the water except the following. And then if you look at the bottom square there, a floating structure that is designed and built to be used as a stationary uh, waterborne residential dwelling which does not have and is not designed to have a mode of power of its own it is dependent for utilities upon a continuous utility linkage to a source originating on the shore permanent uh, continuous hookups to a uh, shoreline system. That's not me. Those are not allowed. Uh, the third page there, uh, it, it describes a, um, uh, what a document vessel is and, and what a undocumented vessel is. The little square I, I, uh, I, I have there, you are required to register your undocumented, undocumented vessel and pay the fees, all right? In 1999, I talked to Don Hadley, and I asked him, well, I'm going to have a problem building a vessel like that other vessel over there. He said, no, but you have to pass the test. You have to be approved through the Coast Guard. And so I did. And we launched a Jody K, and uh, we've been there ever since. The following page, what are, the what are the regulations for a registration number? I had to register as a vessel. Uh, and I needed to get a, oh man, I'm out of time. Can I get another minute here? This item will come up again uh, huh? at the June meeting. Uh, so there'll be another time for discussion on this particular item. I can continue? Uh, not at this present moment because each okay. speaker only is allowed th three minutes, but this particular item will come up again at the June city council meeting. The, the city manager will talk oh, to you. Okay, thanks a lot. Great, thank you. Our next two speakers. Well, at this time it's six o'clock, so let's go to the public hearing item okay. and we'll come back to the remaining speakers. Yes, all right. Our public hearing item is adoption of resolution approving regular coastal permit to allow the construction of a two-story single family residence and the conversion of an existing two-story dwelling into an accessory dwelling unit located at 217 South Pacific Street within the appeal jurisdiction of the city's coastal zone, Plumeria residence applicant, Daniel and Amy Coleman. Open the public hearing. I've uh, driven around the site and uh, uh, no staff either. I just, I've read the reports. I drove by the site, but I haven't talked to anybody about it. 
staff only. No public comment. Uh, driven by the site probably several thousand times and staff only. All materials been provided to the council. Rob? Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. I'm Rob Dimahowski, Associate Planner with the Planning Division. I present to you this evening the Plumeria Residence, a request for a regular coastal permit for the construction of a two-story single-family residence and the conversion of an existing dwelling into a two-story accessory dwelling unit. The primary dwelling will have a three-car garage accessed from the Strand, and the project is subject to and in compliance with Proposition A height limitations. The proposed primary dwelling would be 3,778 square feet, three bed, three bath, and would be 24 feet in height. And the proposed accessory dwelling unit would be a 1,198 square feet, two story, and it would be 12 feet in height from the Pacific Street elevation. The project was reviewed by the Downtown Advisory Committee on January 24th with a vote of 5-0 recommending the, down, the Community Development Commission approve the project. The project site is located at 217 South Pacific Street within the appeal jurisdiction of the coastal zone and has a zoning designation of downtown subdistrict 4A, which is intended to provide a mix of transient and permanent residential uses between the South Strand and Wisconsin Street. Surrounding land uses include a variety of multifamily homes, short-term rentals, as well as single-family residences. The the 4,198 square foot parcel has frontage on both the Strand and Pacific Street and is currently developed with an 810 square foot two-story dwelling that was constructed in 1928. The remainder of the parcel is vacant and paved with asphalt. The proposed residence would be constructed in accordance with the development standards of the downtown zoning ordinance. The two-story residence would include a three-car garage in tandem configuration and would be accessed from the Strand. Pedestrian access would be available from both the Strand as well as Pacific Street via staircase. The applicant is proposing to convert the existing 810 square foot dwelling into a 1,198 square foot accessory dwelling unit in accordance with the accessory, accessory dwelling unit provisions per state law in accordance with government code 65852.2. The ADU would qualify for a parking exemption in accordance with state law with proximity and half mile of a public transit station, which would be the, the transit station. Landscaping for the project would include a variety of hardscaping and plantings throughout the site, including drought, drought tolerant plants. The proposed single-family residence would have a maximum height of 24 feet as measured from grade. Both the primary and the accessory dwelling would have second-story decks facing to the west. The primary dwelling would have a rooftop deck that would be in full compliance with the height exception policy per the memo dated August 24th of 2017. The architectural design of the primary dwelling reflects a contemporary style with various materials that include smooth finished stucco, composite siding, lead stone veneer, tempered glass guardrails, as well as natural wood siding. The existing dwelling uh, that should become the accessory dwelling would, would uh, maintain a cottage style, would not be increased in size, and would uh, include the, including the roof pitch, but would be remodeled and updated with similar colors and materials of the, the primary dwelling for a, a unified appearance. As previously noted, the project is subject to Proposition A, which was adopted in 1982. Prop A specifies that no new structures built on the strands shall exceed the current elevation of Pacific Street. The applicant conducted a elevation survey of Pacific Street and determined that the current elevation at, at the project site is 40.15 feet as measured from sea level. The maximum height of the proposed dwelling would be 39.67 feet. The existing dwelling to be converted to the ADU is approximately 12 feet in height above the, the grade of Pacific Street. No expansion or increase in height would occur above the elevation of Pacific, Free, Pacific Street in full compliance with Proposition A. 
Staff finds that the proposed project is conformance with the general plan, the zoning ordinance, and the local coastal program. The project would promote high quality architecture and enhance the visual quality of the surrounding neighborhood and is consistent with the housing element policy of encouraging accessory dwelling units. The project complies with the local, with applicable zoning requirements and is found to be consistent with the local coastal program and the fact that no impacts will occur on coastal access. There's public access to the, the north on, on Tyson Street Park, as well as uh, other public access points. And the, the project would not be required to provide any new public access due to this, the size of the, the parcel. The project would have no impacts on coastal views based on the proposed height and compliance with Proposition A. And the project would not have any impacts on, on public parking based on the fact that no parking would be eliminated with the construction of the project. Based on these findings, staff recommends the Community Development Commission confirm issuance of a CEQA exemption per section 5303 new construction or conversion of small structures and adopt project resolution to approve regular coastal permit 1703. This concludes my presentation and I'm available for any questions. At this time, the applicant can come forward if they wish to do so. Any public? Oh, did you want to come forward? Or do you have a representative that you'd like to have speak? Yeah, you have 20 minutes to be able to do whatever you want. Yeah. Hi, good evening. My name is Andrew Carlos. I'm a California licensed architect uh, working for the Coleman's. And, uh, you know, we've worked uh, over the last year pretty diligently to put out a high quality product um, to um, improve the strand and to provide, uh, you know, programmatic requirements for my client. Um, probably the, the one thing that I'd like to mention um, is that the, the cottage that's on Pacific Street is one thing that we really wanted to preserve um, because we felt like that was uh, an important integral part of kind of the beach community and part of Oceanside. And so um, just wanted to make note of that so that everybody was aware of kind of the thought process behind that design. Um, and then one more thing just to mention um, is that I think our parking requirement is only two and we are providing three parking stalls. So I know in the congested beach area, it's always nice to have an extra parking stall to keep cars off the street. So um, I'm here if there's any questions about the design specifically. And then I know Daniel Coleman also wanted to address council. Council members, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak and present our opportunity here. Um, we are Oceanside residents. We have been for many years. We are also um, business owners. We love the city of Oceanside and we love the opportunity that we've been given to essentially present this plumeria residence. Um, it's something that our family is planning to live on. Um, the ad additional dwelling unit, we're potentially looking at parents that are aging and this is an opportunity for them to live with us in the additional dwelling unit. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is a public hearing item. Any members of the public who wish to speak on this specific item may come forward at this time. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and Council Member Feller. Thank you. Uh, I thought that was unique as well, saving the uh, cottage up on top. I'm, I'm thinking that that's a pretty cool place to sit right in that front yard there. Uh, uh, I think this is a great addition for the Strand, especially that location. It, it uh, will kind of maybe rejuvenate a couple of other properties around you. And, and uh, I'm glad to hear you're taking care of your old, old parents because <laughs> I'm hoping that happens to me. So I move a, a, a staff's recommendation. Councilmember Sanchez. Thank you. I do have a question for staff. The three parking spots are, all three are tandem. Does that mean it's one behind the other behind the other? Honorable Mayor and Council Member Sanchez, 
the parking will have two side by side and the third space will be in a tandem configuration. So oh, the I third see. space, the, the two spaces that are required for the primary dwelling unit, and the third space is a extra space that can be used for either the accessory dwelling unit or a third space for the primary dwelling. Okay. Well, well um, in that case, yeah, I, I, as, you, as you know, <laughs> um, I was actually hoping that, especially on, on the coast, um, we would finally do away with the tandem and also the lifts. And, but this one is actually an extra one that is not required. Um, so in, in effect, two side by side, people will be able to get drive in and out. So I'm gonna go ahead and support this. Thank you. We have a motion and a second, please vote. Motion approved, five zero. Let's go back to 16. Yeah, our next two speakers are Jim Jenkins, followed by Audrey Listy. Honorable Council Member, uh, Honorable Mayor and Council Members, Jim Jenkins, Rancho Del Oro. I'll save my stuff regarding the harbor for June since we got plenty of time to work on that. Uh, one of the items I'm a little concerned with is I know on April 18th you guys had a the Mayor and Council workshop. And some of the things I'm concerned with is that items were discussed and brought up, and there's two of them there in general that I thought were kind of weird that they were discussed, motioned, voted on, and passed but there wasn't proper notification. I mean, we've got the issue with the aides, and the, the concerning part about that is I think the aides that the council members have really take a big workload off of each council member and allows their time to be more freed up to get out and work with the community, the public, allows for the open door policy to be there, and I think that's a real significant impact and, and feature that each council member has. Um, I know Deputy Mayor Lowry just walked away, but. Um, you know, I want to give him kudos for the fact that he really made some great uh, uh, recommendations and, and appraisal to Don Green, his, his aide, for the work that he put in in that six-inch binder on the uh, medical marijuana ad hoc committee. So that shows how many hours that aide put into that program that I don't think there's any way the council member could do it by himself. So that, that's a concern of mine eliminating these positions when a lot of the council members stated that when they come to this position, they're gonna create jobs and opportunities for the people of the city of Oceanside. So now what I see by this vote and everything that's taking place, you're gonna end up firing your aides? So now you're eliminating positions that you said you're gonna create for people in the city of Oceanside? I just don't think that's quite right. So that's one of my concerns. The other one is, I understand the, uh, the Melrose extension was brought up again. And that was item that I thought was put to rest, laid, laid down, dead, and gone. And now that's been brought up during the workshop meeting, and it's been motioned and proposed here. And now they're putting approximately, what, $6 million towards the uh, beginning of the phased implementation of that. You know, I mean, I don't understand how that, that's happening when that was supposed to be put to rest. I also understand there may have been some communication, a conversation with city manager stating that was an item that was put to rest and, and was not gonna be brought back up, and here it is. Uh, one of my concerns I have is on your agenda items, it states very clearly on workshops. At a workshop meeting, the city council may vote on any properly agendized matter, and public input is provided on the agenda. I still haven't found these two items anywhere agendized. So how did they get a motion made and how did they get voted on and approved? I mean, nobody had a chance to come in and speak. No public notification, nothing agendized. You know, if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm okay to be wrong, but please tell me where it was agendized at and the public was notified. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Audrey. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here representing my share of the Ocean Har Side Harbor, and I'd like all those that came tonight that are also representing the harbor to stand up. And some have left. And we have not been notified about these changes. It was just a fluke that we found out. The man, there's, it's a one-man show. And all these people are here with the same concerns that I have. 
And um, we are a community out there, and a lot of things and our rights are being taken away from us without even a get together with us and letting us voice our opinion about these changes. They're just being made and voted on without any reference to what we want or anything that we need. There's things we need, like safety. And the homeless are up at the bathrooms. We can't even go or let our children go up to the bathrooms at night because there's homeless all around. But yet, they're going to take away our barbecues and our, our get-togethers. That's not right. We are a family down there, and that's what you guys are encouraging, Oceanside City families and, and get-togethers. And now they want to take them away and say no more barbecues and, and no more this and no more that. It's not right, and I just wanted to say that we need to have a public impact. Maybe he needs to notify us and maybe get all of us members of the harbor together and vote on it and give him ideas of what we want, not him bringing his ideas from some far off harbor where the people aren't even at the harbor. They just come down for vacation and then they go home. But we actually live there. We're a community there. We use the beaches and there's activities. We wakeboard and snow, I mean, not wakeboard, um, you know, but we have paddle boards and stuff, and they want us to take those away from us and things. It's just not right, and we just are asking that you hear us and let us have a voice in this instead of just one man show. We have three more speakers. Through, through, the, through the mayor, um, could we ha make sure that there is a dedicated time through the Harbor and Beaches Advisory Committee to that this um, item be um, really properly noticed so that there can be that kind of interaction um, prior to this coming to the council? Um, if I could, Honorable Mayor, Council Members, um, this was voted on at the last Harbor and Beaches Committee. However, they're going to have yet another meeting and they're going to do um, some decent outreach so everybody knows when the meeting will be. And at sometime in June, this item likely will not come back to the Council until August. What was voted on? They, I understand your concerns. Um, what is referred to as the blue book was voted on, but we are opening and continuing getting more um, input between now and August, so we encourage you to participate in that. Do, do we have a date for the meeting in June? I believe it's June 18th, but I'm not entirely sure, but we'll certainly post it. Um, Right, well, so please come to that meeting and you have three minutes each to speak and um, perhaps, and it's more informal than this is and hopefully there'll be more, um, more, dis more good discussion about it. Maybe some things will be changed. Next speaker. Three more speakers. Uh, we have Sheila Keda, Bob Natella, and Wayne Hill. Hi, I'm Sheila Keda to 92 Greenway Road. I too am questioning about the Melrose extension and you had a budget meeting, I think, and then you voted on it and four to one passed the Melrose extension. Does that mean that the city of Oceanside is gonna be six million dollars to do a Melrose extension, uh, take away something like 12 to 14 homes, do something with Guahami Park, and you're only gonna get three seconds of faster time, and it's going to benefit Vista more than the, than Oceanside, and I think the best thing to do would be to widen Vista Way to a four lane and from the 70CX where it meets up to the four lane. I mean, I this is to me. I thought the Melrose extension was put to rest. I don't think the people want the Melrose extension. I don't want the Melrose extension. I don't want to put six million dollars towards the Melrose extension and then more million does, uh, dollars into it. I want to have money for the pool at El Corazon and for after school programs and things for seniors. I don't know. I don't think that something like this should be voted on by the council and determine I think the people of Oceanside as constituents should be able to decide on this. I am very much against the Melrose extension and I don't think this is right. That's it. Bob Natella. Mm -hmm. 
Hello, Council. Um, Bob Nutella, Oceanside. Um, I'm just uh, speaking, and I sent an email earlier uh, today that hopefully you guys get a chance to see later on or, or view it already regarding the cannabis decision. And my, decision, my, my discussion isn't regarding um, the decision itself. It was when you finally get uh, 10 minutes uh, to hear what the, the, the team says, the council uh, people say, um, it really was um, evident that the education of the council on, on cannabis is, is, is lacking um, tremendously. Um, when you had people on the team saying that medical marijuana is anecdotal twice in their discussion on, on passing something and whether or not something is a Schedule I drug, um, those are elementary pieces. And um, there are millions of people that are benefiting from from medical marijuana, and the fact that, you, that there's part on the team thinks that it, it's not working for people is is saddening. Um, I have patients, and it it would sadden me if I told them that no, it's just in your in your mind. So what I want to do is use the time, and I've asked a couple times, is let's try and educate, let's get everybody on the same page from an education standpoint. Uh, on June 27th. GW Pharmaceuticals will have five U.S. patents for a, a cannabis product for epilepsy. Their home headquarters is in Carlsbad. That will be the epicenter for, for medical health care. And, it, and it's going to continue to go in that direction. The U.S. government has a patent on cannabinoids as a medicine. In the abstract that you see below here, it says it helps Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autoimmune disease. Right? There's a lot of things going on. The U.S. government has been growing cannabis since 1968, the University of Mississippi, and they have been cultivating and distributing to patients since 68. So we just have to try and do a better job, I think. I know we want to try and get the sheriff to, to, to do some things, and, and I think he should have done it, been a little bit more professional in his approach instead of standoffish. But I think that there, there should be some effort in educating everyone on the same page. You've got 40,000 seniors in Oceanside, 40,000. By 2020, 25% of them, based on UC San Diego's, their aging department's study, will be using cannabis or trialing cannabis for pain, for sleep, for overall health. Please try and get on board. I know you still have open agendas on it, and I think there's some opportunity. Thank you. Wayne Hill. Wayne Hill. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, first off, I'd just like to say how much I appreciate the rest of our slip renters here today to speak to you, and especially your response on uh, being advocated as to hearing from us. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of letters will be written to you in the uh, next coming month or so, and I hope that you'll be uh, listening to a lot of our feedback, and I think that's gonna be fantastic. Um, Really, most of my, my point was explained by Audrey and the rest of the slip runners here. Um, we'll all be writing into you and giving our feedback in a, you know, in a written notice. And I uh, just want to say I appreciate your feedback on us. Thank so you. thank you very much. See you in June. No further public on this item. So we have no mayor or council items. Is there any general council member comments? Yeah. Council member Sanchez. Thank you. First of all, um, I would like to invite um, the public to participate in whatever way possible with the um, Relay for Life that's happening this weekend in Oceanside. So it is Saturday and Sunday, starts at 10 a.m., ends at 10 a.m. Um, and I've, I've been um, fortunate enough to get on a team. It's the ALA 146 Warriors team with my friend Mary, who was here earlier, with the Poppies. Um, this, this one, really means a lot to me. Um, um, I am walking for my friend Laura. Uh, I think, uh, Jack, you remember Laura? Yeah. She was in her 50s when she died of cancer. Um, my Aunt Mary, my cousin Lucy, my cousin Jackie. These are just all within the last two, three years. Most recently in September, 
my mom. I'm, um, there, we're, we're sending hope, love, and prayers to also our survivors and caretakers, and uh, that would be um, um, my friend Mary, who was here, um, survivor, my friend Rena, Nadine, and Sandy. Um, we're fundraising. The um, event, entire event, event, is hoping to raise $155,000. Um, they've raised so far $89,063. Um, so any small amount would be fine. Just go to the um, Relay for Life, Google that, and you'll find us, the Oceanside event. Any small amount. Um, would love for you to, to uh, donate to our team, the ALA 146 Warriors, that's the American Legions. Um, I, I know we ha also have a team for Oceanside, City of Oceanside. Um, I started talking to my friend Mary um, a while ago about what she was doing and how she's just been so, so brave. And um, she stands out as someone is, is you know, really, she and, and, as I said, other, other friends like um, Nadine and um, Rena and, and, and right now Sandy's going through this. So um, it's, it's a positive, of course, and hoping that we finally find a cure for cancer, finally find a way of detecting it better than what we just have. Um, my mom, between the time that she, it was detected and her, her passing was less than 30 days. And that's because you can't, it's, it's impossible to detect pancreatic cancer. Um, and the second thing I'd like to do is adjourn in memory of Margaret Peggy Malik. And I hope you all remember Peggy. She used to come to the council meetings on a regular basis. She's a longtime resident of Oceanside, I think over 20 years, but she still maintained that kind of New Yorker, um, Italian kind of passion and, and kind of accent. I first met Peggy, I think I was standing in line to, to speak to the council, um, because this was like, I believe it was 1999, it was about the Manchester Project. It pretty much divided the city in half. And I remember the meetings going until midnight. So I got to meet a lot of folks in line to speak, and Peggy was one of them. Um, after I got elected, I saw Peggy again, and this was in um, Melba Bishop's living room. Oh, is that a 10 minute? Oh, no, it's just a three minutes. Uh, <laughs> sorry, no, no, it's a three minutes. Peter says it's okay. Uh, this is a really, really special person. I wrote down some things. Um, this was probably early 2001. She was uh, extremely upset about the proposed Manchester project. It was a, do you recall, it was a 12-story hotel at our pier area that would have bulldozed, bulldozed the, the bluffs, privatized the pier, amphitheater, and community center areas. She came to every council meeting to voice her objection. She was a pretty um, fierce speaker. It was to include a golf course at El Corazon. If you remember that, guys, yeah. Um, it was, um, and the way it was given to Manchester, it was just, you know, part of the discussion. Um, and that was done in 1998. She was furious about it as she participated in the El Corazon Vision Plan of 1997. The 500 acres had been given to the city in 1994, along with $1.4 million in restoration funds by the sand mining company. We were able to win against the Manchester project, but it was not clear what the council would do with El Corazon. And certainly that became something extremely important to, to um, Peggy, that that stay and be our, the vision that, we, that she worked so hard to be, and that's the vision of El Corazon. In 2002, she participated in the Save El Corazon Park Initiative, gathering signatures, and also on Jim Wood for City Council campaign. Both were on the ballot in 2002. Jim won, but the El Corazon um, Initiative lost by just a handful of votes. Thereafter, the, the council agreed to form a committee, the El Corazon Steering Committee, and guess who got on the committee? Peggy Malik. Um, it was my honor to appoint her to it. 
And in the end, while council members were not invited to come to those meetings, I believe that Peggy's not to be ignored New Yorker slash Italian voice carried throughout. She was definitely instrumental in creating the El Corazon Park master plan, including the senior center and soccer fields, following very closely the original El Corazon vision plan. When the council decided to dissolve the committee, Peggy was appointed to the city's Parks and Rec Commission by Mayor Jim Wood. She served for 13 years until her death. In addition to all of this, Peggy was a fierce protector of Jeffrey's Ranch in South Morrow Hills. She would tell me stories about her fight to keep projects out of, out of or near Jeffrey's Ranch, including the Melrose Extension and Melrose Bridge. She was successful in most of her efforts. And while she was not able to stop the Home Depot, if, I, if you guys remember the Home Depot, she made sure it complied with every one of the conditions that were placed on the Home Depot. She loved her neighborhood. She loved our children and seniors. She loved Oceanside. She was a huge reason we have been able to win so many battles. Most recently, she was helping to collect signatures to once again save South Morrow Hills and Jeffreys Ranch for the Save Our Open Space and Agricultural Resources SOAR initiative. That petition was just certified on April 23rd, which means it will be probably be on the ballot in November, this November. Most of all, I am so proud and blessed to have been able to have such a wonderful close friendship with her. I loved her very, very much. She was a warrioress, a very loving person, co courageous enough to do battle and to love, both with so much passion. She survived by her husband, Michael, the Phantom. I used to call him the Phantom because all I ever saw was, um, was Margaret, Peggy, um, her daughter, Gina, her son, Michael. Her celebration of life will be on June 29th at the El Corazon Senior Center at 6 p.m. if we can adjourn in her memory. Thank you. So we'll adjourn to a workshop at 2 o'clock on Wednesday, May 2nd, regarding state mandates for organics. If we could please um, stand for a moment of silence for Peggy. This program is made possible with support by AT&T, mobilizing your world. North County cities have had at-large elections for as long as they have been incorporated. At-large elections are those in which all voters of the entire jurisdiction elect all of the members to the governing office. This year, the majority of North County cities will, for the first time, have district elections. This change establishes districts, equal in population, with voters in each district electing officials who live in that district. This change has been motivated by the desire to comply with the 2001 California Voting Rights Act and to avoid a potential lawsuit threat from attorneys associated with the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project. The goal of district elections is to provide equity for disenfranchised minorities whose vote is diluted by citywide elections. The California Voting Rights Act of 2001 states that, quote, an at-large method of election may not be imposed or applied in a manner that impairs the ability of a protected class to elect candidates of its choice or its ability to influence the outcome of an election, unquote. A protected class is defined as a class of voters who are members of a race, color, or language minority group. Hello, my name is Zach Beck, City Clerk of the City of Oceanside, and I would like to share some important information with you regarding the new voting districts that have been established in the City of Oceanside. I will explain how the districts will be phased in during the next two election cycles and how this change will affect those who choose to run for office in Oceanside. 
Furthermore, I'll provide information to you regarding the resources you need to determine which district you live in, as well as my contact information in case you have any questions concerning this new voting system. With that being said, let me provide some background information on how the City of Oceanside created these new districts. On May 3rd, 2017, the City of Oceanside adopted a resolution to begin the process to transition to district-based elections. The Oceanside City Council held four public hearings to take public comment in regards to the composition of the council districts. My office held five community meetings during the month of May 2017 to provide the public with the opportunity to draw district maps together in an ethical, independent, and transparent manner. On June 21, 2017, the Oceanside City Council voted unanimously to direct staff to bring forward the Communities of Interest map. This map was drawn by the public and was given final approval by the City of Council. At the City of Council meeting on July 25, 2017, the Council introduced an ordinance establishing bi-district elections for the City Council and approved an election calendar for the newly created districts and on August 1, 2017, the City Council voted to adopt the ordinance. Now that we have provided the background information related to how the City of Oceanside developed these districts, I would like to share some demographic and geographic information related to the details of each individual district with you. First, we have District Number 1. District Number 1 has 40,064 residents in it, and it runs down the coastline from the harbor to Oceanside Boulevard. The district then goes east along the Oceanside Boulevard corridor until it reaches El Camino Real. The district then continues north on El Camino Real to Mesa Drive and goes east to Rancho Deloro Drive. Once there, it continues to Highway 76 and heads back west until just before reaching Fusat Road. Then the district heads north to the Camp Pendleton border. The district then finally runs along the Camp Pendleton border back to the coastline. That is District Number 1, also known as the Northwest District. Next, I would like to share the demographic and geographic details for District Number 2. District Number 2 has 40,982 residents, and it begins just east of the intersection of Fusaw Drive and Highway 76. Then the district continues east along Highway 76 until it reaches Douglas Drive. It then moves north along Douglas Drive to the San Luis Rey River. It then continues east along the San Luis Rey River to College Boulevard, where it then heads south to Mission Avenue. It then goes east along Mission Avenue to North Santa Fe Drive, where it continues south to Glenview Lane and heads east to Mission Meadows, and incorporates everything else that is northeast of that region within the city limits, including the Jeffries Ranch neighborhood and the Morrow Hills neighborhood, until it reaches the Camp Pendleton border. It will then run west along the Camp Pendleton border until it reaches just west of Fireside Park. That is District Number 2, also known as the Northeast District. Next, I would like to share the demographic and geographic details for District Number 3. District Number 3 has 43,875 residents and incorporates all of the coastline south of Oceanside Boulevard to the Carlsbad border. The district runs east along Oceanside Boulevard until it reaches College Boulevard. It then heads south to Olive Drive, going east to Emerald Drive, and then continues south along the Oceanside Vista border until it reaches the border of Oceanside and Carlsbad near the Ocean Hills community. The district then continues west along Oceanside-Carlsbad border until it reaches the coastline. That is District Number 3, also known as the Southern District. Last, I would like to share the demographic details and geographic details for District Number 4. District Number 4 has 42,419 residents and it begins at the intersection of Oceanside Boulevard and El Camino Real. It then runs east along Oceanside Boulevard to College Boulevard, heads south to Olive Drive, and then continues east to the border of Oceanside and Vista, all the way to North Santa Fe Drive. The district then heads north along North Santa Fe Drive to Mission Avenue, moves west along Mission Avenue to College Boulevard, and it then continues north along College Boulevard to the San Luis Rey River. It then heads west along the San Luis Rey River to Douglas Drive, and heads south on Douglas Drive to Highway 76. It then turns back east to Rancho Del Oro, goes south to Mesa Drive, and returns back west to El Camino Real, and concludes by going south to Oceanside Boulevard. That is District Number 4, also known as the Central District. Currently, each member of the Oceanside City Council is serving an at-large term, which means that until their term expires, they will be serving in an at-large capacity, and they are allowed to live anywhere in the City of Oceanside to serve on the City Council. However, when their term expires, they will be required to live within the boundaries of one of the districts that will be on the ballot during the election in order for them to be eligible to run for that particular city council seat. 
Members of the public are also eligible to run for City Council as long as they live in the district that is on the ballot and they complete all of the required nomination paperwork with my office and the California Secretary of State. The new City Council districts will be phased in during the next two election cycles. District number one and district number two will be introduced during the November 2018 election. District number three and district number four will be introduced in the November 2020 election. After all the districts have been introduced, the City Council will be comprised of four City Council members who each live in and represent one of the established districts. The mayor will remain elected at large. In regards to the current council members who choose to run for City Council in 2018, there are two incumbents who live in District No. 1. Councilmember Esther Sanchez was elected in 2016 and is serving an at-large term until 2020. However, Councilmember Sanchez is eligible to run for City Council District No. 1 in 2018. If she wins, she will vacate her current at-large seat and then represent District No. 1 until 2022. Councilmember Sanchez, if she loses, she will remain on the City Council in the at-large seat until 2020. Councilmember Chuck Lowry was elected in 2014 and is serving an at-large term that expires in 2018. If he wins, he will represent District No. 1 until 2022. If Councilmember Lowry loses, he will no longer be on the City Council. Councilmember Jerry Kern was elected in 2014 and is serving an at-large term that expires in 2018. Councilmember Kern lives in District No. 2, which is on the ballot in the November 2018 election. City Councilmember Jack Feller was elected in 2016 and is serving an at-large term until 2020. Councilmember Feller lives in District No. 3, which will be introduced during the November 2020 election. There are currently no incumbents living in District No. 4, which will be introduced during the November 2020 election. In order to find out which district you live in, please visit the City Clerk District Elections page on the City of Oceanside website as shown below. There is an interactive map on the website which allows you to type in your address in the search bar and it will show you which district you live in. You can also contact myself directly with any questions you have. I can be reached at the email below or you can call me at 760-435-3010. We are entering a new era of elections in the City of Oceanside and I want to do everything I can to make sure that you are informed and aware of the changes that are transpiring in our community. Please let me know if there is anything I can do to be of assistance to you on this item. Thank you for taking the time to remain active and engaged in our beautiful city. I hope you have a positive and productive day. This program is made possible with support by AT&T, mobilizing your world.